Audio Jungle. Audio Jungle. Welcome to part four of this guide to fair shares. In this section, I'm going to go through each of the popular forms of enterprise and show how they fail to deal with complexity. I'm going to start first with private enterprises that don't have investors, perhaps started by one person or two people going into business together. How do they fail to deal with complexity? Well, it's really quite simple. Labour, users and investors are not recognised as owners of the products and wealth that their interactions create. Wealth is created when people who labour produce goods and services that users want to use, and people who back them often share in the wealth that is created. Also, founders acquire exclusive control over intellectual property needed to generate wealth. What this means is that people who actually create that intellectual property, the labour force of the organisation, are then excluded from the wealth that is generated by it. That's just a byproduct of this type of enterprise, because if you are an employee, all the intellectual property that you create goes to the owners of the business. And if there's just a small enterprise with one or two owners, they acquire all the IP through their exclusive shareholding. Private enterprises without investors exclude labour, users and investors from membership. Instead, they enter into a series of contracts in ways that lead to exploitation and, of course, conflict. So founders have to engage with the complexity, bureaucracy and expense of commercial contract law and employment law to address the failures in their constitution. The simple constitution fails to address the complexities of attracting labour and satisfying users. OK, now let's look at a private enterprise that does have investors. How does that fail to deal with complexity? Well, of course, labour and users are still excluded from a fair share of the wealth that their interactions create. But if you have investors, you're now going to have competition between the founders and the investors to extract wealth from labour and users. Founders can address the relationships with investors by modifying articles of association that accommodate their interests, but it will still fail to address the complexities of satisfying product and service users and providers of labour. OK, now let's see how a charitable association fails to deal with complexity. Charitable associations get money from donors, grant givers, members and sympathetic lenders maybe. The users of a charitable association become its beneficiaries and they're typically excluded from determining how the wealth that has been given to the charity is allocated to meet their needs. This comes under the purview of trustees. So the founders, labour and those donors and members None of them are supposed to profit from the wealth created by stakeholder interactions. It is supposed to go to the beneficiaries. So in a charity and a non-profit, the founders and later on the trustees have to be guided by trust law, which says what they can do with the money from donors and how they can allocate it to users who are beneficiaries. The constitution still struggles with the complexities of labour relations and it can still create barriers to borrowing money from investors. Now there's another type of charitable organisation called a foundation. How does that fail to deal with complexity? Well, charitable foundations tend to attract a different kind of social investor, often wealthy individuals or corporate sponsors, sometimes people who are called impact investors and even governments. They will have users, but the users may fund beneficiaries by purchasing the products of labour and they still have little power to control how the wealth is allocated. As with the charitable association, founders, labour and users are not supposed to profit from the wealth created by their interactions. It's the social beneficiaries, the venture philanthropists, the rich individuals who put their money into the organisation and of course the people who they want to be beneficiaries, who 
will see all of the benefits from this type of enterprise. Next, we're going to look at worker cooperatives. Do they also fail to deal with complexity? Unfortunately, they do. It is laudable that labour becomes the main beneficiary of the wealth created by stakeholder interactions. And labour can also make social investments through what's called a capital contribution. But worker cops have their own problems. Research has shown that they try to use up the power of founders. And those founders can behave unpredictably by retaliating, by leaving, or perhaps by demutualising a worker co-op to prevent the loss of their power. They can be users of a worker co-op and they can still be beneficiaries, but they don't have collective power to allocate the wealth that is generated by the enterprise. So a worker co-op can deal with the complexity of, of labour relations, but other contractual relations with investors or users are unaddressed. And there is this issue of whether founders are going to come to resent that their power has dissipated and been marginalised by a growing workforce of members. Now, last but not least, there are consumer co-ops, sometimes called user co-ops. Their similar, or their failure to deal with complexity, is similar to a worker co-op. But this time, users have become the main beneficiary of the wealth created by stakeholder interactions, and it's labour that is excluded. Users, as in a worker co-op, can make social investments through capital contributions and become social investors. But users and consumer courts limit workers and founders power, and they might even regard them as having a conflict of interest. So for example, in many consumer courts that I've studied, they limit or completely exclude worker consumers from being on the boards. Workers can still benefit as users. So for example, I am a member of the co-op store and I know that there are employees in the store that can also be a member, but they have no power as workers to allocate wealth that is equivalent to the power of users. So in consumer co-ops, the founders can address the complexities of relations with users or customers, but they still have to resort to the complex bureaucratic and expensive contracts with labour. And that applies also to developing expensive contracts if they try to secure external investment. So to sum up part four, all of the popular forms of enterprise with which we're familiar make things more complicated by failing to deal with complexity. The only way you can deal with complexity is to enfranchise all of the stakeholders on which the enterprise depends for success. And that's what I'm now going to talk about in the last and final part of the Fair Shares Guide. Thank you.